Uh, let's pray and then we'll open God's word in Colossians. Lord, we pray that as we come to your word, that we'll hear you speak and that by your spirit, you'll apply it to our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you'll correct our faulty thinking this today. We pray you'll correct our faulty hearts. We pray, Lord, whatever is crowding you out, whatever is taking the place on the throne where only you belong at the centre, whatever we're sharing our love with when it's not, Lord, wholly devoted to you. Lord, we pray that you'll expose, Lord, idols, expose, Lord, sin, expose, Lord, our wrong way of thinking about things. And Lord, would you link up, Lord, what we say we believe to what we live out in our lives? Would you link up our living, Lord? Would you, Lord, if we say, Lord, we love you, would you help us, Lord, to, to live that out in our lives? And Lord, we just pray for your help by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, just go to the text. Let's just, let's just start there. Colossians, and it's chapter 1, and it's verse 13. And we're thinking this morning about, again, the cross of Christ. This is our series that we're working our way through. And this morning we're into this whole image of redemption, is the word we want to keep our eyes out for. So Colossians, this is the text I want to really preach. This morning is just one short verse. We may go to other portions of Scripture, but this is the predominantly where I want a, us to be looking at. So Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. I want to read that again. I try to think it through. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom in christ it's in him that we have anything of god's it's in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins so this is the word this morning it's redemption now i just want to give you a general flavor of what the word actually means before we go any further the general meaning of this is it's a commercial term from the ancient world it's a commercial term mainly from the slave market. This is where you would get this word redemption being used. The flavor of the word is this. It's the paying of a price to set a captive free. That's what redemption is. It's a price being paid to set a slave free. Someone who's in a bad place, someone else comes along maybe and pays a price and that person comes out of that position and into another position, out of slavery and into freedom. There's a price being paid for a captive. Someone's being delivered from a state of captivity or being released from a penalty maybe of execution of death. as redemption. That's what it means. When a slave is set free and a price is paid, there's redemption. There's, there's been this issue of being redeemed. That's what's happened. When a prisoner of war is released in exchange for a payment, sometimes in ancient days when a war happened, they would take some prisoners and then they would look for some money back to let the, those guys out if they were worth a few quid. So that was the redemption price and the price paid was the ransom. So a, 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 cap, a captive of war would be taken, a price would be paid and he'd be set free. The price was paid and that was the ransom price. This is the type of thing we're talking about. Freedom. Liberty. People being uh, taken from one p position that's a bad position and being redeemed and taken out of it because a price has been paid and now they're in a different position. That's what we've just read. This is just the gospel. But let me just set some more, uh, I suppose, foundations on it from a, from a Bible commentator. Leon Morris has said this, as far, and I quote him. He said, quote, as far as I am able to have, as, as far as I am able, I have searched the literature of antiquity. And my conclusion is that redemption always denotes deliverance from a state of captivity or deliverance from slavery or deliverance from a death sentence. That's how the word was used. And he says, and always it is deliverance in a particular way by the payment of a price. The idea of the payment of a price is fundamental to redemption, unquote. That's what he said. So this is the gospel. This is an image of the gospel. It doesn't take much imagination to see where this will be going. A slave being set free because a price has been paid is all about what Jesus has done for you and me. And he's done for all who will come to him. I just want to work through the verse really simply as I can. I want to make three points this morning. Three questions of, of uh, what it is 
uh, about redemption that this verse can teach us. And I want to ask, firstly, who does the redeeming? Secondly, what happens in redemption? And thirdly, what the price of our redemption was? And we might need to, well, we will need to uh, over, over read through the next verse to get the last point. But it's, it's, uh, it's implicit in the verse itself. But we'll get to that in a moment. Firstly, verse 13. Get your, get your nose into the Bible there, please. And uh, Colossians 1 and verse 13. Who does the redeeming? This is the question. Who does the redeeming? Because religion gets this wrong and Christianity gets it right. Religious people think that they're going to do the redeeming. They think that they're going to do the work and they're going to earn the credit and they're going to get free in the end if they do a good enough job. That's not Christianity. Because I want you to look at the verse 13. And the first four words just blows religion out of the water. That's it. It's over. Because it says this. He has redeemed us. He has delivered us. That's the, that's the words. He has delivered us. Who does the redeeming? God delivers us. It's God who steps in. God delivers man from his bad position, if you like, from his slavery. And God sets him free. And it is Almighty God then who steps in and rescues us from our bondage and our slavery. It's God who does it. Just look at those words. He has delivered us. We have done nothing. It doesn't say we did good works and we, because we were good, God rewarded us. And, uh, and maybe in the end we'll get delivered. That's what religion tells me. As far as I know, I was pretty religious when I was younger and I thought that that's the way religion worked. But Christianity, look, it's obvious. Look at the verse. He delivers us. God steps in and God does the work. Now, you may be saying, hang on a minute, you're going too fast. You're talking about being in slavery. You're talking about us being in a bad position. I don't feel like I'm much of a slave to anything. Slavery to what? Slavery to what? What am I a slave to that I need so much this salvation, this redemption, this God to step in and do anything for me? I don't think I'm much of a slave. That's a pessimistic view of humanity, is it not? What are you talking about? How am I a slave? Well, Jesus, in John's Gospel, if you want to turn up John, please, chapter 8, I want us to see it. And I want us to hear that it's not me or any man making the claim. But it's the Lord Jesus himself. If you believe him, if he's a good enough authority, we will listen to him. And John's Gospel, chapter 8 and verse 31. Jesus is talking to some religious Jews. Although it says that they believed him, it's not the, the saving type of faith in this, in this instance. John 8, 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, we are the offspring of Abraham. Now here they are, they're lying back on their heritage and on their religion and on their tradition. We're good guys. They're saying, we're the offspring of Abraham. What are you talking about? We've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Now listen to what the Lord says. Verse 34 of chapter 8. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. So the Bible teaches us, and you can trace it all the way through, that we're all slaves to sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we're sinners, and we're slaves to it. It has dominion over us. It rules the roost. It rules our life. And if we don't get released from this slavery, if we don't get this redemption that God steps in and he delivers us from, if we don't get that, we will be eternally separated from a holy God because God is holy and we are sinful. And holiness and sin don't mix and never will. And God will never come to terms with our sin. He'll never just say it's okay. He'll always expose and judge sin. But what the gospel does is it gives us a way through the judgment because Christ takes the judgment for you on the cross. And God doesn't wink at sin and sweep it under the carpet. He gets it out and he judges it in his son. And when we repent and put our faith in Christ, he sets us free. But we're running on a bit, a bit further there. We need to be redeemed from the curse of the law. We need to be redeemed from the slave market of sin. Now you may be saying, okay, well you've, you've made this point about sin making us slaves, but what, you know, what is it, what's, that, what's that like in reality? I want to read you another quote 
from Leon Morris. I wanted you, it's, it's, it's a little bit lengthy, but it's, it sets the tone and it helps us think it through. He says, sin makes slaves of all of us. Take, for example, the person who has a temper and which of us is guiltless. He finds that his outbursts causes trouble and unhappiness to all sorts of people and more particularly to those he cares for most in life. So he repents. He decides that he will control himself and not say those harsh words anymore. And if he is a strong person, perhaps he succeeds for a time. But then one day, along comes the provocation, and before he knows what is happening, he has burst out in those angry words and deeds which bring so much unhappiness to others and deep sorrow to himself. Do you see what is happening, he said? He is not free. As far as this thing is concerned, he is a slave. He's a slave. And in greater or less measure, the same is true of every sin. Perhaps you can remember the first time you committed a particular sin. It was quite a struggle. You resisted the temptation, but in the end you lost. Next time, there was not the same struggle. And later, there was less still. In time, he says, you came to the wrong thing almost easily and naturally. Do you see that the evil has made a slave of you. It is, unquote, we'll leave him there. It grinds us down. We, we, we follow after sin. We do this by nature. We're under its dominion. We can't get out. We're in trouble. We need redemption. So I want to get back to my point is he has delivered us and that's Christianity. It's God stepping in. It's the God who delivers his people from slavery, particularly to sin, but the devil and death and everything else thrown in, the curse of the law. And in the book of Exodus, that great salvation event from Israel's history, when you think about the gospel, it's always helpful to go back to when God set his people free in Israel, or from, from Egypt, when he set Israel free from Egypt. It's always helpful to go back and see the shadows and types of what we're, ha- what we're talking about over here at the cross. And in the book of Exodus, God's people, you'll remember it, you've read it, haven't you? They were slaves to Pharaoh. That's where they were. They were under his dominion. Their life was a misery. They were in a sorry mess. They hated life. Life wasn't good under Pharaoh, burdens daily. Hard labour. Life under this powerful enemy was absolutely wretched. And this is where God's people had found themselves. And they needed to be redeemed from their captivity. This is the point. And the long and the short of it is this. In Exodus, the story is that God the Redeemer steps in. And he does what they couldn't do for themselves. He delivered them. This is our verse. He delivered them. And if you want to open, please. And he redeemed them. And open, please, Exodus chapter 6. I just want you to show God making the promise and using the word that we're dealing with today. Exodus chapter 6. And it go, go to verse 2. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them There's grace. He gives them the land of Canaan. That's the promised land. The land in which they lived as sojourners. You know, God gives us heaven as a gift. He promised his people in the Old Testament that he would give them the land. Do you know what he promises you and me? He's going to give you the entire earth. He's going to give you the universe. He's going to give you heaven. And he's going to be there. And we're going to be his people. He's going to be our God. It's grace. It's a gift. He says... He says, I also establish my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan. In verse 5, moreover, I have heard their groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians had hold as slaves. And I have remembered my covenant. Verse 6, say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And with great acts of judgment. Do you see the flow of who's doing what? It's God seeing their plight. And it's God stepping in. And I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to give you land. I'm going to give you freedom. That's what Jesus does for us. All the way. It's all of God. And it's nothing of us. All we do is we come and put our faith in Christ. 
We come and leave. We, we agree with them about our sin. Yes, it's horrible. Yes, I'm a slave. I want to repent of it. I want to turn away from it. And I want to trust that you've done the work on the cross with great acts of mighty judgment. And it all fell on Christ. It was coming to me, but it fell on him and he's my saviour. And I put my trust in his finished work. Then you're redeemed. So it's free. And it's free forgiveness. And the bondages can be broken. Because that's what he did here. He broke the chains of their slavery. And Jesus promises eternal life as a free gift to all who come to him. But the big point is this, and I've been laboring it. He has delivered us. It is God who redeems. It's God who saves. It's God who reconciles us to the Father, okay? It's Jesus who does it. You can't save yourself before we move on. I just want to I want to bang this point home. The Bible is clear. You can't save you. You can't reconcile you. You can't redeem you. You can't set yourself free. You need a saviour. You need someone who's going to come and let you out and break the chains and do all the work for you because you're a mess and you're weak. And while we were yet weak, Christ died for us, says the scripture. So you need God. You need a saviour. The simple thing is you need Jesus. I need Jesus. That's why he came. That's why he's hanging on a cross. And it's through your faith in that sacrifice that will break the chains in your life. Or else you'll hang, those chains will hang on you for all eternity. Those chains will bring you down forever unless Christ releases you. So the slave is taken out from his previous master's authority and transferred into the ownership of another. And that's what happens when we become Christians. So what happens in redemption is this. I want to note three words here from the text. Let's get back to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. What happens in redemption? Who does the redeeming as God? Now, what happens in this redemption? Let's look at it. I just want to notice three words here. I want you to notice the words delivered. This is what happens in redemption. We get delivered. We get transferred is the other word. We get forgiven. Look, look at those buzzwords in the verse. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us, there's the second word, into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So deliverance, transference and forgiveness. The slave gets set free and the sinner gets forgiven. The slave gets set free. It's the same thing as saying a sinner gets forgiven. Forgiveness breaks every chain off us. Forgiveness sets us free. And this is what happens when we trust Christ. When we got delivered from the domain of sin and the devil, and we get delivered from an empty way of life, says the scriptures. You get delivered from an empty way of life, and you get delivered from the curse of the law. That's what we got delivered from. We got delivered, in other words, says the text, we got delivered from a dominion, a kingdom, a dominion of darkness. That's how the Bible describes it. We were in a dark place. The dominion of darkness is the text. If you look at that word there, and we get delivered. This is the big word, delivered from that uh, dominion. And see, what the Bible says is this, and it might sound pessimistic, but it's, I don't care because it's true. I, I don't care if at times we sound as Christians pessimistic because we've got to stick to what the Bible actually says. And if it's true, we've got to deal with it. We can't. So the Bible says that the whole world is under the sway of the devil. The whole world lies under the sway of the evil one. And it's 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. If you want to look it up, look it up. It's not me saying this. Under the devil's control. Slaves. In the devil's power. Slaves. Chained in wickedness. Slaves of sin. The Bible says we're children of wrath. But we get delivered. We get delivered out of a domain of darkness. And not only that, redemption is deliverance. It's forgiveness and release of the captives from the grip of evil. It's not only that. He doesn't just take us out and leave us in a vacuum. God could have just, maybe he could have just saved us and, and said, look, I'm not going to send you to hell. I'm going to take you out of that horrible state you're in, but I don't really want much more to do with you. I, I, I'll set you free, but I'm not going to have fellowship with you. You know, you can be holy on your own over there, but I'm not interested. Even that would have been a grace of God, I think. If he'd have saved us from hell and left us over there and said, look, you guys deal with it yourselves. I've done as much as I can do. But God 
doesn't do that. This is the thing. Look at the verse. It says that we, we get redeemed out of a dominion of darkness. We get delivered out of that. But there's also a transference into. Look at where he takes us from. Look, read the verse with me. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. And he hasn't left us on our own. And he's transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. You see, God saves us and he brings us to himself. That's what he done with Israel in the Old Testament. He said, I have redeemed you. And he says, I have brought you to myself. You're saved. Not to live your life in a vacuum. Not to do what you want to do and live your life. Oh, it's great that I'm going to heaven one day when I die. But I'm going to get on with things here now. No, God saved you to have a relationship with him. God saved you for himself. He didn't save you so you could have a good time and, you know, you take that burden of hell off your mind and that's it. He saves you to come into a relationship with him. That's what it's all about. You're transferred into his dominion now, if you like, into his kingdom. It's the kingdom of his beloved son, the Lord Jesus is king. When you get saved, you're saying, Jesus is my king. You get saved saying, I need to be delivered from a dominion of darkness and I want to be transferred under the reign and rule of Christ. Wherever Jesus is, I want to be. Whatever he says I want to do, I love him. This is what the Christian does. This is what the Christian agrees to upon salvation. God has not only delivered us from the enemy and sin, God has adopted us as his family. God has ceased to be our judge. He's become our father. He's transferred us into his kingdom. He's become our king. We were rebelling against him and now we're under his authority. And we love him because it's free. And it's all because, look at the verse, look at how the verse ends. It says, we, in whom we have redemption. It's all because of the forgiveness of our sins. Those, those chains again that were keeping us back. Our sins would have kept us in bondage for all eternity. Now, again, pessimistic but true. So we've got to deal with it. Sin, God hates sin. God's going to judge sin. But he loves us and he doesn't want us to come under his condemnation. So he made a way of setting us free. This series is called the cross of Christ after all. This is why he did it. There's a judgment coming but Christ will take the judgment and pound it in your place and set you free. Because God is love. God is holy but God is love. And how do you reconcile the two? It's in the cross. He can, in, in his holiness he can judge your sin and in his love he can set you free. Through what Jesus did for you. Now thirdly, what was the price paid to redeem us? What, you know, what was the amount or how did we actually come into this to, to be get set free? How did God forgive us our sins? Or what was the price to be paid? And this is so important that we understand this as a close. Because the price to deliver you and me was huge. I think this is, the, this is the burden that God wants us to get into our heads this morning as we take this home. Let's read on a little bit. We've been focusing on verse 13 of Colossians 1. Let's read now verse 15 for a few verses more. Let's see the price that was paid and who paid it. Verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. And he says, it's almost like, I don't care what you say. I don't care what science discovers. I don't care about a Higgs boson or a Big Bang. It's like a stress in this. It's saying like, Jesus created everything, visible and invisible, whether it's thrones or dominions, whether it's rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. There you go, scientists. Take that one. Jesus made it. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Now this is the person. This is his glory. Watch this. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. He's divine. And through him to reconcile all things whether on on earth or in heaven, making peace. This is the shock and this should shock us. Making peace by the blood of his cross. How do you get that at the end of a verse like that? How do you get a bloody death on a cross? How do you get Roman torture after the description of the, of the person we just had there? The eternal God. What's the price of our redemption? I think God wants us to get this into our heads this morning and enjoy it and be challenged by it. 
The eternal God, God the Son, had to die on a cross, naked, battered for you to set you free. That's the long and the short of it. It was a gruesome death. He bore the wrath of God in your place. And that was the price he paid to break the chains of sin from off you. The one who was the very image of God, says the text. The one who was the creator of everything. The one who sustains everything by his powerful word. The one whose power holds all things together. This is who we're talking about. The preeminent one himself. And here's the shock. Made peace by the blood of his cross. We took him as humans. We treated him like a dog. We put nails through his hands and his feet. And we hung him up. And we tried to kick out God out of this universe. We gave him our worst. Look at who he is this morning. Let that sink in. I think that should shock us. After we read his glory. Who he is and what we did to him. And how he did that for you. It's shocking. It's not obvious at all that Jesus will come and die for you. It's not a given. It's not like, oh yeah, God came and he loved me because I'm quite a good person. It's, this isn't obvious. This is shocking. You know, we've had Christianity maybe, or, or Christian uh, theory and teaching since we're no height. But it, look, it should shock us what happened and what we did with Christ. But listen, it should, it should encourage us. As we close, I want to encourage you with three things. Look at who he was and look at what he'd done. But look, let it encourage you that the Lord of glory hung on a cross. Let it encourage you that God is love and God loves you this morning. Can you see that from what happened? He himself died to set you free. He proved, the Bible says, you know, he demonstrated his love towards us on the cross. When you look at the cross, you're looking at love in action. You're looking at the, the greatest display of love that the world has ever or will ever see. We'll be singing about this display of love for all eternity. So we will. Because it's massive. It's powerful. And, the, and on the cross it says, God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ and all who he was died for us. So don't doubt this morning through your past hurt. Say life has been hard. Say you've been in the burdens and the slavery of sin and all that sin has brought into the world has harmed you. Other people have harmed you. You've harmed yourself. The enemy loves to take the harm of sin and say God doesn't love you. God's against you. God's doing this to you because you deserve it. And I want to say, no, look at the cross. God wants to set you free. Sin is a wrecker. Sin does wreck us. But he died for you. You can't say he doesn't love you. No one can say God doesn't love me when they see Calvary. So don't believe the devil's lies. What he wants to do is he wants to bring you to himself and heal you and help you and bring you along life's journey. So be encouraged by God's love. Secondly, be encouraged by the value of your life. We live in a world now that doesn't value human life. We live in a world, I was at a, at a march yesterday to oppose abortion. We want to scrape human beings out of their mother's womb. We want to take clippers and cut their arms off and their legs off and put them in the bin. But look, the Lord of glory died for humanity. And he died for you. And your life is worth living. You are valuable. And humanity in itself is valuable because we are made in the image of God and we're loved by God. Made in the image of God. Sin is ruining that image. Christ is redeeming that image. You're to be conformed more and more to the image of Christ. We were made in God's image in the beginning. Sin marred it. When we get saved, Christ redeems and he's restoring that image. You're going to be like Jesus one day. You're valuable. And thirdly, let this teaching this morning encourage you to respond to him appropriately. To link up what he has done for you and what on earth you're doing for him. Link these things up in our life. Let's be real with God. God died for us. God bought us at a price. You are not your own, says Paul. This is how he applies it. He says, you know what? You're living your life any way you want. You're not your own. You don't belong to you. The gospel is that I set you free from sin and death and hell and I bring you to be my, to be my own. You belong to me now. This is how it works. Not saved to run off and do your own thing. But it's not burdensome to us. So be encouraged. He paid a great price for you to set you free. Be encouraged then to live appropriately in response. He bought you by the blood of his cross. 
And I want to challenge us as we, as we leave this now. Does he not deserve your complete, wholehearted love and response? How have you responded to the cross? Does he not deserve your complete loyalty? Does, does Jesus not deserve your complete devotion? Not a half-hearted mess of a life, but does he not command and demand? And is the appropriate response to Christ not, I'm going to give my all for him. I'm going to do my best for him. I'm going to live for him. Is this not what it's about? Does he not deserve better than our lukewarm service at the moment? I'm challenged myself. I mean, this week God really brought home to me those verses that he, uh, where he restored Peter. And the bold question, and the only question, and the repeated question is this. Look, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Not asking you, do you love church or things in the church or the Christian? Do you love me? Because that's what it's about. I loved you. Do you love me? Love so amazing, so divine, demands my heart, my life, my all. Does it demand yours? Does it get any response? I believe God's going to use what we're saying here this morning to change our attitudes. What sins are we holding on to this morning that Christ has already asked you long ago to surrender? What are you up to that Jesus has asked you time and time again in love? Look, you're mine now. Give it up. What patterns of living are inconsistent with your belonging to Christ? You're bought at a price. What secrets that only you know and Jesus knows about that you are refusing to give up? You've been delivered from the domain of darkness. Come out of it and walk in the light. What's God saying this morning to you in this? So let's be reminded of what Peter said, and I'm closing with this. 1 Peter 1 verse 18. He says this, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty way of life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God.